So welcome once again to our mini-series called The Rescuer. Uh, we are now in part four, okay? If you miss any of the uh, first three uh, messages in this series, you can always go to our uh, YouTube or our uh, Facebook page and, or even listen to our podcast uh, and I think it's also posted on our website. So again, you don't have any, there's no excuses anymore uh, to miss any of these messages. Now, uh, once again, this, this series, this mini-series is a prequel to our main sermon series, which is coming up right after this one, uh, which will be on the book of Exodus. Uh, and the goal of this series, this mini one, uh, is to show us why and how the Israelites ended up in Egypt in, in the first place. Uh, and it will therefore hopefully give us a, uh, a more complete picture of the story of God's people in Exodus, uh, you know, showing that they, how they got into Egypt, and obviously in Exodus, uh, you know, seeing how they are uh, freed uh, from the slavery uh, in Egypt. Uh, now, last week, uh, the main thing that I wanted us to notice about our text uh, is that God's earthly blessings can and will be used by our enemy, Satan, in order to rob us of God's spiritual blessings. That's the main point of last week's message. That the enemy can use God's blessings, earthly blessings, uh, in order to rob us of God's spiritual blessings. Uh, and we saw, that how, we saw how the enemy did that uh, last week. Uh, he used Joseph's God-given looks, and not just looks, but character, uh, in order to tempt Potiphar's wife uh, into tempting Joseph. Uh, and I also said that the, the enemy was able to use God's gift of sexual desire. Uh, we said that, that sexual desire uh, in and of itself is not evil, okay? The fact that some of us have it is, is because God gave it, this, this desire to us. Uh, and this desire is supposed to be is for um, to be used and to be enjoyed within the bonds of of marriage. But just like what I I said uh, last week, the enemy can use any of these earthly gifts uh, in order to tempt us. So that's what he did. He used sexual desire in Potiphar's wife in order to tempt her to tempt Joseph. Uh, and in the story uh, last week, we saw how. Uh, and what it looks like to fall into temptation, uh, the way Potiphar's wife did. Uh, in fact, as we continue to read the story this morning, we will see how deep, just how deep Potiphar's wife has fallen into temptation. Uh, if you can still remember, I also said last week that being tempted in and of itself is not sinful. Okay? It's not sinful to be tempted, but falling into it uh, leads to and becomes sin. Uh, James 1, 14, again, and 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured by his, and, and, and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. That's what temptation does. In and of itself, it's not sinful. But when you fall into it, that's when uh, it's harmful and it's, and it's, it's bad for us, right? Uh, and I even... Um, mentioned that temptation is like quicksand, right? Being around quicksand is not going to kill you, per se, uh, but if you step into it, uh, it will. Uh, the quicksand ultimately will not kill you itself, uh, but it will make you vulnerable to things that can kill you, uh, like dehydration, suffocation, uh, predators, and even drowning. Uh, for, from an incoming river or tide. So the quicksand itself, if quicksand is like temptation, it's not going to kill you, okay? But it will hold you there until you die, right? And that's what's happening to Potiphar's wife. Uh, and that's what happens to us when we fall into temptation. Usually it keeps us there. Uh, and whatever it is, the consequences of the sin that we commit, uh, once we have fallen into temptation, uh, ultimately it's what's going to kill us, uh, both physically and uh, spiritually. Uh, that's what's happening to Potiphar's wife in this story. Uh, we saw how she fell into temptation and how the enemy is using her weakness to hold her there, right, so that she couldn't get out. Uh, now, 
we're going to talk about that more later on as we go through the text. But right now, uh, I want us to focus on where we left off last week. So uh, I, told, I said last week that both Joseph and Potiphar's wife were both being tempted. Uh, but then we also saw examples of how uh, someone uh, falls into temptation, how they do it. Uh, but this morning, uh, we're going to talk about how the flip side of that and how someone can actually fight against uh, temptation. And we're going to see that uh, again through the life of our boy Joseph, right? Uh, so again, even though both were tempted, Potiphar's wife fell, Joseph did not. Now question is, and this is what I left you with last week, how was Joseph able to resist temptation? And I just resist, but flee from temptation. I hope to show you that answer in our text again for this morning. So we'll start with, uh, by, we'll start by reading again uh, verse 8. And then we're going to go through these verses and I'll, uh, you know, I'll share with you what I observe and uh, what I learned uh, from Joseph and how he was able to flee uh, and overcome temptation. So verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house, in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. So what's the first thing that we can learn from Joseph and how he was able to overcome and ultimately flee from temptation? First thing is that Joseph had integrity. Okay, Joseph had integrity. That means that even though Potiphar was not watching, even though Potiphar was not there, Joseph still that did what he was supposed to do as Potiphar's most entrusted slave. Right? In other words, Joseph remained true to God, to himself, and to Potiphar, whether Potiphar was present or not. Uh, and again, if you think about it, the easiest way to fall into temptation, the easiest way, the easiest way that we do, that we fall into temptation, is when we're alone. Right? Nobody's watching. It's just you. right? Uh, for most, for some of us, it's just you and a cell phone, or it's just you and your iPad. That's where you get tempted. right? Not just by pornography, but some of us by shopping. right? Uh, but that's when, when you're alone, that's the easiest time to fall into temptation. Temptation when nobody sees what we are doing. Uh, and when, what we can observe from Joseph's life is that the first way to fight against it is to have integrity. Uh, now, what does it mean? What does it mean to have integrity? Uh, integrity is a character trait, okay, uh, that only you and God know if you have it or not. Okay? I'm not going to be able to tell if you have integrity or not. Uh, I don't know, right? If you don't, you can just lie to me and say that you do. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying that integrity is this character trait that only you and God know uh, if you have it or not. It is, uh, ultimately, it is, integrity is the quality of being honest uh, and having an internal consistency, whether you are by yourself or with others. Uh, or to put it another way, to have integrity is to be sound. Okay? Meaning that you are stable, that you are solid right? and firm when it comes to your morals uh, and your principles. That's what it means to have integrity, to always be true, whether you're in front of people or whether you're alone. Uh, and this characteristic of integrity, uh, you can't work on it. Um, I believe that it only comes by God's grace. It only comes by a change of heart and mind through the work of the Holy Spirit to stay vigilant and remain consistent as to who you are, whether in public or private. Uh, it's not something that we work on. It's not something we can study. Uh, it is a God-given, I, I would say, gift again uh, when it comes to our character. And God uh, works it in us through the work of the Holy Spirit and by faith, right? Now, I've heard it said that the first step to fighting temptation is to always think that you're never alone, uh, that God is always with you and that he sees everything that you do, right? Uh, 
Uh, I've heard a lot of preachers say that. Oh, you know, one thing, one way to fight temptation is always think that God is with you. Uh, he's always watching you and, and, and uh, you know, seeing everything that you do. Uh, and that's true. Uh, God sees everything, right? Um, therefore, if, if that's the way of, of your thinking, some people think that if that's the way you think, uh, then therefore you can resist and you fight and overcome temptation. Uh, I mean, there's, there's truth to it. But in reality, most of the time, okay, I say that it doesn't work, that kind of thinking, but most of the time, it doesn't work. <laughs> All right, how many of you have, have thought about that and still did what you were thinking of doing anyway uh, because you were alone? Uh, I sure have had that experience, right? We all know that God is, you know, omnipresent. He's everywhere. But don't tell me that, you're, you don't fall into temptation anymore because we still do. So that kind of thinking uh, that, you know, God is everywhere, that he's always watching, um, a lot of times it doesn't work. Uh, but having integrity uh, is, is not, it's not just thinking that God is always there watching you. Uh, having integrity is having a change of heart to always want to do the right thing, uh, whether you're by yourself or whether there's people around. Uh, and that change, again, can only come by God's grace or the power of the Holy Spirit to change a person from the inside out to actually want to do the right thing. Uh, because ultimately, um, um, integrity is uh, actually valuing God's presence in our relationship with Him through faith. Uh, it is not just knowing that He exists. It is valuing His presence and our relationship with him through faith. Uh, that's what should fuel integrity uh, as followers of Christ. Again, not just the fact that God sees everything that you do. Uh, also, uh, it is this, with this integrity that we ultimately fight against temptation, especially when we are alone. So it's not enough just to think, oh, God is here with me, so therefore he's watching me, I'm not going to do this. He's actually valuing that presence uh, and that relationship that will help us fight against temptation. And ultimately, that's what it means to have integrity. So number one, how did Joseph overcome temptation? First, through his integrity. Second, Joseph overcame the temptation, the temptation of sleeping with Potiphar's wife because of his view on the sanctity of marriage. Or let me, let me add, because of his high view on the sanctity of marriage. Read uh, verse 9, the first part of verse 9. Joseph said, He is not greater in this house than I am, referring to Potiphar, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. Now, notice how Joseph puts himself as almost equal to Potiphar, right? When he said, He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me. We're pretty much equal when it comes to authority over the house of Potiphar. Potiphar has given Joseph the authority over everything that he owes. But the one thing that Joseph recognized is the sanctity of Potiphar's marriage to his wife. And not just their marriage, but how sacred and the holy the act of sex is when it comes to husband and wife, right? In other words, Joseph's view of sexual intimacy within a married union is as high as God's intended purpose and use for it. Let me say that again. Joseph's view of sexual intimacy within a married union is as high as God's intended purposes for it, right? Sex and marriage have always been you know, together, biblically, when I'm talking about, I'm talking about biblically. Nowadays, it's, it's not. Uh, sex is some kind of, uh, you know, sport, some kind of pastime nowadays. But really, when God created sex and designed sex, it was supposed to be enjoyed within the bonds of marriage. And that has a special thing to it. That's why God designed it that way, right? So the question is, why did God design sex to be enjoyed only within the bonds of marriage? What is the reason for that? Uh, ultimately, the act of sexual intimacy in marriage is a pointer back to God. 
uh, as a giver of good gifts. In other words, the pleasures that a couple gets from a healthy sex life is but a taste of the pleasure that they both will experience when they finally meet God face to face. Uh, and it's only through the bonds of marriage that that experience of sex can be that good. God could have just designed the sex for human beings the way he designed the sex for animals, just for procreation, right? You think, they, they, you think animals enjoy sex? No, they just have to do it in order to, to procreate. But for humans, it's different, right? Not just for procreation, but for the enjoyment of both husband and wife. And I'm saying... And, and, it's a pointer, that enjoyment, that pleasure, that satisfaction that you feel when you're you know, in a marriage and have a healthy sex life. Um, that enjoyment that you feel with your wife is a pointer back to, to God as the giver of good gifts and ultimately the ultimate satisfaction uh, that we can experience. Right? That's what sex was, human sex was designed for. It's a pointer back to God, right? Uh, and, it's, and it is on, the only real sex that a person can truly experience. Um, you know, sex outside of marriage is fake uh, because there's guilt to it. You don't, you don't, um, you don't feel the, the, the deep, uh, soul-satisfying effect of what real sex means if you have it outside of marriage. Outside of marriage, sex is just, you know, uh, the satisfaction that it brings is only, uh, you know, uh, it's shallow. Uh, but within marriage, it's a whole different uh, kind of experience. So uh, we can say that um, um, having a healthy sex life within a marriage is, is that. It's a, it's a gift from God because it ultimately points back to him as a good giver. Or we can say that real sex, the way God intended for sex to be enjoyed, can only be tasted and experienced within a marriage because in God's design, sex is not just a physical experience but also a spiritual one. Uh, what do I mean by this? Um, let me use an illustration, okay? So in God's design, sex is not just a physical experience, but also a spiritual one. What does that mean? I'll use an illustration. Uh, it's like this. It's like, it's like eating out, eating takeout, versus eating at the restaurant. Okay? This is, God's, this is, this is what it looks like. Okay? Sex outside of marriage is like eating takeout. Sex within marriage is like eating at a restaurant. We're eating the same food. Okay? But eating takeout offers a very different experience and satisfaction compared to eating at a nice restaurant. The quality is not the same. Uh, even though the food is the same, the quality, the experience, the satisfaction that eating out brings is not the same or I would say doesn't even compare to eating at a nice restaurant. Those of you who are... Foodies, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like for me, sometimes I'd rather just eat leftovers uh, than eat takeout. Uh, okay, my wife, and I say sometimes because there are sometimes that I do eat, you know, drive-throughs and all that stuff. But eating, like, if I know that there's a restaurant out there that's serving this food, I'd rather eat it at the restaurant uh, than have to take it out and bring it home and have to reheat it and all this stuff. It's just not the same. Um, I think that God's design for sex is the same way. Uh, having sex outside of marriage can offer an, you know, eating takeout kind of satisfaction. Uh, but it does not compare to the eating at a restaurant kind of satisfaction that real sex with the bonds of marriage brings and the way that God designed sex to be. So sex outside of marriage will give you flesh level or physical level satisfaction but sex within marriage will give you the, that and more satisfaction that goes beyond physical. So uh, for, for Joseph, he knows this. He knows that there is something else more gratifying than just sex by itself. 
he knows that God designed marriage and sex intimacy in marriage, sexual intimacy in marriage, as a higher form of satisfaction because ultimately it points back to him. So for Joseph to taint his first experience of sex by having sex with another man's wife is like robbing himself of experiencing true, real sex, which is far better with his future wife. Uh, ultimately, wanting what's best and wanting what's most satisfying is what helped Joseph overcome that temptation. So Joseph knowing, the, uh, having a high view of the sanctity of marriage uh, and seeing that as better, uh, ultimately, that's what helped him uh, overcome temptation. Uh, I think it's the same for us. Uh, if we're being tempted to settle for something that we know cannot deliver the, the same joy that we have in being in a relationship with God and enjoying the presence of God, then I say, and the Bible says, don't settle for it. Because right? that's all you're doing is settling uh, for it. Uh, if you've experienced God in a way that, you know, that left a mark deep inside your soul, um, then don't settle for all these other, other things that temptation is tempting us with, that the enemy is tempting us with, uh, as far as, you know, you know, getting satisfaction is concerned. Because really, if you've experienced God, none of those other things compare. Uh, so let's fight our urges and only settle for the best. Okay? So again, how did Joseph overcome temptation? Uh, first, because of his integrity. Uh, and second, because, it's because of his high view of marriage and the sexual intimacy that goes with it. All right? And again, we, we talked about this last week. Uh, God did not just design sex procreation, but for enjoyment, but also as a weapon against temptation. We talked about that last week, right? So, um, uh, for husband and wife, the, the Bible even talks about, yo, have sex, right? As a husband and wife, don't withhold sex from your partner because it is God's way to just, to, first of all, give you pleasure that points back to him. Uh, and also it's a, it's a tool, it's a, it's a weapon against temptation. Uh, so don't, like husbands, wives out there listening, okay, don't use sex as currency. Never do that. I know some husbands and some wives use sex as currency. Like, you know, you can only have sex with me if you do this. No, uh, that's not what that's, God did not design sex for, for that. Uh, God designed sex for his purposes and that his purposes are always for his glory, right? Uh, so when we think about that and we think about the sanctity of marriage uh, that sex is enjoyed in, um, that's what we can learn from Joseph, that that kind of sex is better because that God designed it to be that way. All right, so don't, and again, don't taint it by using it as currency. Uh, it wasn't, sex wasn't designed to be that. So how did Joseph overcome temptation? First is with his integrity. Uh, second, because of his high view of marriage and the sexual intimacy that goes with it. Okay? Uh, third and last, uh, how did Joseph overcome temptation? Joseph was able to overcome temptation because of his relationship with God. Again, back to chapter 9. Or sorry, chapter 39, verse 9. Second part of verse 9. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Okay. So the whole verse, he was talking about Potiphar and how Potiphar made him the, the, pretty much uh, equal to him, except for giving him his wife. Um, so it was all about Potiphar, right? And then his conclusion is, uh, how can I do this thing, uh, this wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say sin against Potiphar. He said sin against God. So the third thing that, um, you know, that, Joseph used in order to overcome temptation is that he valued his relationship with God. Uh, no, there was an article in DesiringGod.org entitled, Lie With Me. Uh, and it says this, and I quote, uh, Joseph was not mainly worried about losing his job, his money, or some sexual pleasure. He refused to lose God. 
His glory was too beautiful, his friendship too precious, his promises too great for Joseph to lie with her. If you want to stay out of bed with someone else's wife, make yourself as happy as humanly possible in God. Okay. Ultimately, our fight against sexual temptation, and I would add, against any temptation, uh, comes down to knowledge and preference. Okay? Our fight against any temptation, not just sexual, comes down to knowledge and preference. As human beings, we will naturally prefer and gravitate towards what is better and which one brings us the most joy, brings, brings us the most happiness. Now, if that's true, that if all human beings are like that, that we naturally gravitate towards what's better and what brings us the most joy, then we should ask ourselves this question. How well do you know or how intimate do you know the thing that you are being tempted with versus how well do you know or how, how intimate are you with the thing that you're being tempted away from? Okay? Let's, let's, let me repeat that, okay? If it's true that all human beings gravitate towards what is better and ultimately what brings in the most joy, then we should ask ourselves this question. How well do we know or how intimate are we with that thing that we are being tempted with? Or, on the other hand, how well do you know or how intimate are you with the thing that you are being tempted away from? Okay. In other words, when it comes to you know, earthly pleasures versus spiritual pleasures, okay, are we feeding ourselves or are we feeding our desires with more knowledge of the things of this world and not enough of the knowledge of God? That's, that's basically the question. What are you feeding your heart, your mind, your heart? Right? Are you feeding yourself more knowledge of the things of this world and not enough of the knowledge of God and who God is and the satisfaction and pleasure that God brings? If so then your tendency is to gravitate towards and prefer that which we are more intimate with or which we, are more, which we know more about, right? Let me give you an example for those of you who still don't get it. Um, it's like when you're being tempted to buy stuff, right? Uh, for me, recently, it's been looking at, uh, looking at houses and looking at bikes, okay? It's summer again, you know. I gotta look at, I gotta look at bikes. I go biking. We go biking a lot. Uh, some of the men here at church. So, so I'm saying, the more knowledge that you have of something, the more intimate you are with something, naturally you will gravitate to that because you know it. You you know the kind of joy that it brings, right? So when you keep looking at bikes and you keep looking at whatever, okay. Uh, Naturally, you're going to gravitate to that. If that's all you're feeding your mind, um, you're going to gravitate to that. Um, but what about the other half? How much are you feeding your knowledge of God and who God is? Your experience of God and who God is? How much are you feeding that part? Because if you're not feeding that part, and all you're feeding is this part, obviously you're more intimate with this. So when the temptation comes to say, okay, bye. What do you do? You buy. <laughs> you click on it and buy. Uh, and we're all prone to it. Uh, and I think it's because of that. I think it's because it comes down to preference and knowledge. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, the, the more you know about something, the more intimate you are with that thing. And naturally, you will gravitate towards whatever that thing that you know and more, are more intimate with. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of us, uh, it's, I mean, Talking about myself uh, as well, you know, uh, you know, we fill our minds, we fill our hearts with uh, the things of this world. And so when the temptation comes and Satan knows this, we gravitate towards that. Uh, we fall in to temptation. So, uh, so what we uh, we have, what we have to fully understand and have to realize uh, and 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 know is that. Compared to God, this other stuff 
is worthless. It's 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 not. It doesn't even compare. It's like apples and oranges uh, compared to God or knowing God, who is uh, pure joy and satisfaction. That uh, uh, you know, having a relationship with Him is is is, is nothing like anything else that we can you know that we can even imagine. Um, comparing comparing that to a bike, uh, it, it doesn't even doesn't even make sense right um, so if we if we just focus and if you just you know continue to learn more and more about who God is our tendency would be to gravitate towards that uh, and again as we do that as we gravitate towards God we lose less and less taste for the world therefore we're not as prone to temptation let me, uh, again, let me give you an example, okay? Um, for the men, okay? Men, uh, if you have experience being away, being away from your wife for an extended period of time, I know some of you would like that. Uh, <laughs> just give me one week away from my wife. Uh, no. Um, if you've experienced being away from your wife, uh, let's say for two, three weeks, what is it that will keep you from committing adultery or cheating on your wife? Obviously, right? Obvious answer is what? Your wife will. Your love for your wife will. That even though she's not there because of your love for her, because you value your relationship, because you want her more than anything else, and you love her above all the other women, okay, then you will you won't. You won't fall into temptation. That's what's keeping you from falling from temptation. Uh, or from falling into temptation. Uh, and again, the same is uh, same is, is similar to how we treat God. Are we, is our relationship with God that intimate? The way you're, you have a relationship with your wife. Is it that intimate that when temptation comes, you're like, no, 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 I, I can't. This is too valuable. It's too intimate. This brings me so much pleasure and satisfaction and joy that I can't give that up just for this. Uh, because again, we're human beings, we gravitate towards what's better, what's best. We prefer what's best over what's not that good. Only if you know how good this other thing is, right? Um, Augustine of Hippo, uh, if you know him, uh, he's one of the greatest uh, theologians, I guess, second to the Apostle Paul. Uh, you probably say human, humanly speaking. Uh, he once said, how sweet, and I quote, how sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me, you who are true, the sovereign joy. You drove them from me and took their place, you who are sweeter than all pleasure. Though not to flesh and blood, you who outshine all light, yet are hidden deeper than any secret in our hearts. You who surpass all honor, though not in the eyes of men, who see all honor in themselves. O oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. You can find this in his uh, confessions, okay, Augustine's confessions, number 181. Um, what was wrong with Augustine? Okay. Augustine was addicted to sex. Okay. That was his struggle. He was a Christian, but he just can't seem to give up Sex. He just can't seem to give up sexual intimacy outside of marriage. Okay, what was it that finally pulled him away when he saw a better, a better satisfaction than what sex could bring? And ultimately, it is God. When he finally saw and met God, when he finally realized just how good God is in the pleasures and joy that is in God, being in a relationship with God, 
that's what finally drew him away from the tempting the temptation of sex sexual uh, sexual satisfaction right? now our question is that we, that we should ask ourselves the way Augustine did as well right the question that we should ask ourselves is this how well do you know God how intimate is our relationship with him because if you truly knew and are truly intimate with God the way you claim to have, you know, the way you claim to have a relationship with Him, that that that, that, that relationship is is intimate. Then no temptation is strong enough to pull you away from Him, and no temptation can persuade you to exchange what you have with God for something that is fleeting, and far less valuable. I don't care how strong that temptation is. Right? If you truly knew. And if you truly value your relationship with God, then no temptation should, um, should pull you away from that. Uh, now some will say, but I'm addicted to this stuff. Like I say, I'm addicted to pornography. I can't stop myself. How do I pull myself out? Uh, I remember a sermon by, uh, by John Piper. He said that nobody's really addicted to anything. Uh, he just said that, he said that you only have to have uh, the right motivation in order to get over your, your addiction. So he used the illustration, <laughs> um, he used this illustration. He said that, um, what if, okay, somebody came into your house, terrorists came into your house, put a gun to your wife's head, your daughter, your son's head, or everybody that you love, okay, and said, that if you watch one more second of pornography, you will kill all your family members. Would you still watch? If you're addicted. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind, I don't think, would. Unless you hate your family. Right? But if you love your family, if you value their relationship, if you value them, there is no amount of temptation that pornography can offer that will say, yeah, I would watch even at the cost of their lives. And it's the same thing that Augustine is saying. And it's the same thing that, that the Bible is saying. It's the same thing that Joseph uh, is telling us here in his story. Do we value our relationship with God? How intimate is that relationship that we have with God? Because if we do, if it is that intimate, then you wouldn't want to lose it, right? You wouldn't want to jeopardize it for anything. Just like what I said earlier with the wife. You wouldn't want to lose that. If you love your wife, you wouldn't want to lose that. That's what helps you fight against temptation when it comes. Right? Now, the question is, does this mean that Christians never fall into temptation? Obviously not. We all still do. 1 John 1.8 says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Right? And the truth is not in us. 1 John 1.10 says that if we say we have not sinned, we make him, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. But, good news is, there is 1 John 1.9. Uh, what does 1 John 1.9 say? That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, when you read 1 John 1.9, that display of God's kindness, even though it was painfully obvious that we will still continue to sin, does not mean that we should abuse his kindness and continue to sin. Why? Because God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. It's meant to lead us back to him, and his kindness is also our main weapon against temptation. Knowing that God is that kind, that even though he knows we're going to continue to sin, even as believers, he still offers that, 1 John 1, 9. Right? If you confess, he is faithful and just to forgive. That kindness is not meant for abuse. That kindness is meant to lead us back to him, to repentance. Right? And that all can only come in somebody who truly values their relationship with God. Valuing our relationship with God because by His grace He has caused us to see His kindness 
and goodness and love and mercy and faithfulness by faith in Jesus is our most powerful weapon against the enemy's temptation. Right? Joseph's, uh, Joseph teaches us that uh, in Genesis 39. Right? So once again, based on our text, how is Joseph able to overcome temptation? Through his integrity, through his high view of the sanctity of marriage and the sexual intimacy that comes with it. And lastly, and I think this last one is the main reason for the first two, uh, it is valuing God, his relationship with God above all else. That's why he was able to do this. Uh, verse 10, 39 verse 10. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. 11. But one day when he went into uh, the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. First of all, notice how Potiphar's wife has fallen. How far she's fallen. She didn't stop that first time she asked. She kept asking day after day after day, continuing to tempt Joseph. And again, again, this speaks about the nature of the enemy and the temptations that he lays out in front of us. It's a never-ending battle when it comes to the Christian and, the temp and temptation. Is, temptation is always there. It's always surrounding us every single day. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. When Peter says that the roaring lion is always seeking someone to devour, he doesn't mean physically. That roaring lion is only after one thing, and that is our faith. And our adversary will do anything to kill the faith that God has blessed us with, uh, and he uses all kinds of temptations to do so. Uh, he uses all these baits so to make you fall into Temptation. Uh, ultimately, overcoming temptation, sexual or otherwise, is a fight of faith. Faith to believe that God is infinitely better than sex or any other temptation that Satan throws our way. So, just like Joseph, let's fight. Uh, did Joseph almost fall? Well, he got close enough to Potiphar, right, that she was able to grab his, his garment. So, uh, you know, some are saying that well, maybe Joseph was about to fall because he got close enough. And then he changed his mind, ran away, because he knows that if he falls, once he falls, it's hard to get out. Sometimes there's no getting out. So what does he do? Ran away, left his garment uh, with Potiphar's wife. Uh, and how did he overcome? Temptation Again, it's a fight of faith. Faith that God is ultimately better, that God's relationship, relationship with God is more valuable, uh, more satisfying than anything else that the, that the enemy can offer when it comes to temptation. Right? So, uh, before I end the message, uh, let me just share with you one last thing. Uh, how does this part of Joseph's life point us back to Christ? We've, we've, all, we've done that the previous three messages. It all, uh, sorry, the previous two messages, not last week's, but the previous two messages. Uh, we, I said that Joseph is his mini rescuer, that his life ultimately points back to the ultimate rescuer in Jesus Christ. How does this experience point us back to Christ? Was Christ tempted? Yes, he was. Wasn't sexual, but he was tempted, no matter what, right? So he was tempted. How did Christ fight against temptation? I believe that the way Joseph fought also reflects the way Christ fought, especially when it comes to valuing God and his relationship with him. Right? Jesus always said, me and the Father are one. Right? That's how tight, intimate, Jesus' relationship was or is with the Father. So when it comes to that aspect of fighting temptation, it's easy to see that connection between Joseph and Jesus, right? They both valued their relationship to the Father. Although Jesus 
valuing of his relationship with his father is ultimately way greater than the way Joseph valued his relationship. That's why he's the ultimate rescuer, right? But what about Joseph's high view of marriage? Right? How does that point back to Christ? Does Christ have a high view of marriage as well? Well, um, I don't think anyone has a higher view of marriage than Christ. Paul lays it out for us in Ephesians 5, 25 to 33, right? That Christ loved the church so much that he died to ransom the church back to himself. That's how high Christ's view of marriage is. And Paul says that's the mystery of marriage, right? That Christ loved the church so much that even though the church is imperfect, that even though the people in the church are still continuing to sin, his love for the church is you know, even while they were yet sinners, or we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So again, Joseph's view of marriage helped him overcome temptation. Christ's even higher view of marriage, I think, if he was tempted sexually, would help him overcome uh, temptation as well. So both, their valuing of their relationship to God and even Joseph's view of marriage all point back to the greater rescuer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, that's how Joseph fought against temptation. I hope we can apply that and we can meditate on those truths uh, as we continue to live our lives here in this world where we're just surrounded with temptation day in, day out. Now next week, we're going to take a look at the consequences of Joseph's actions as his life in Egypt takes another turn for the worse. What happened? Joseph did the right thing. But what happened? Isn't it when you do good, good come back to you? Isn't that, isn't that how it works? When you do something good, good will happen to you? Not in this case. Joseph did something good. Resisted temptation. Temptation from his master's wife. He did that. He resisted temptation. He did something good. He did the right thing. But how come something bad happened? What's, 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 what's that about? Right? We'll unpack that next week. Uh, my suggestion to you is you just read the whole story, um, and hopefully you'll be able to understand our discussion next week in this next part of Joseph's story. Amen? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. The Lord let his face to shine upon you. And be great. And be gracious unto you. And be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious. Lord.